Part 1, Chapter 23 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Sacred Seasons and Public Worship. The festal cycle of the Christian world gradually assumed fixed form. The tendency was towards an enlargement upon the apostolic limitation. But each edition was achieved after heated discussion. The Jewish Christian, after losing the traces of the Jewish calendar, was slow to add any new day which might be suggested by the Gentile Christian. The first day of the week for sacred services came constantly into more frequent use than the seventh. But the Jewish Christians continued to use both the first and seventh days, until the first generation had disappeared, when the influence of Gentile Christianity became predominant. Barnabas, Ignatius, and Justin furnish positive proof of the early substitution of the first for the seventh day. That it was called Sunday because of a Saxon god is an old error for which there is no foundation. The first day, however, was associated with the sun in the oldest mythologies. George Smith found on a tablet at Nineveh mention of Sunday as a day of rest. It was a day of gladness, because of the great gift of our Lord's resurrection, the day of new light, the day of the sun. Wednesday and Friday were also used as days of service, but never in the high sense of the Sunday service. The Wednesday service was designed to commemorate our Lord's arrest by the Jewish council, and Friday to commemorate his death. Those days, the fourth and sixth of the week, were called the stations, a military term as a reminder that the Christian is a soldier, and must be on his guard against the enemies of Christ. Of the yearly festivals, the Passover was the most important. It signified the festal commemoration of the sparing of the firstborn of Egypt, and, in a Christian sense, the memorial celebration of the death of Christ. The great Easter controversy arose on the duration of the Easter fast, it was only a question of a few hours, but the whole church was divided on the trivial matter, the western Christians contending for the longer time, and the eastern for the shorter. From Gaul to Pontus the discussion swept. Synods were called, and the strife became bitter. But the western view prevailed, and those who held to the eastern opinion either withdrew their opposition or concentrated into a little sect, the Quarto Decimanians, whose home was confined to Asia Minor and proconsular Africa. They had but a short existence. The Roman bishop Victor refused to acknowledge as Christians all who sympathized with the Eastern view, and excommunicated them. Pentecost gained additional strength in the Christian mind. While the Jews celebrated it in thankful commemoration of the harvest, and the gift of the law on Sinai, the Christian revered it, and placed it very high in his calendar, in commemoration of the outpouring of the Spirit after our Lord's ascension. Epiphany was observed in the East towards the close of the second century. A commemoration of the Nativity was prefixed to it, but became an independent feature about A.D. 386. After that, Christmas was observed with greater or less attention in both the East and the West. The growing reverence for the martyrs led to special services on the anniversary of their death. By a happy thought, the day of the martyr's death was called his birthday. Processions were made on these days to the scene of the martyrdom, churches were erected over the remains of the martyrs, memorial sermons were preached on the anniversary, and the special day was added to the calendar. This tendency, innocent and natural in the first four centuries, afterwards became a superstition, and brought many evils into the church. On the memorial martyr days, the Lord's Supper was celebrated, with a view to continued fellowship with the martyrs. It was called an oblation or sacrifice for martyrs, sacrificium pro martyribus. It must be remembered, however, that during the entire patristic period these memorial days for martyrs were no part of the order of the church. They grew out of the fame and merit of Christians 
who died sooner than renounce their faith in Christ. The martyrology of the Roman Catholic Church, the large use of images, and the realistic services, were all of a much later and less spiritual origin. No mention is made of special buildings for Christian worship until the close of the second century. Tertullian, who died about 230, speaks of going to church and of going to the house of God. The church was on the plan of the Jewish temple and the synagogue. It was called the Lord's house, the house of prayer, the house of the church. The architecture of the first churches was simple, and gave no promise of the subsequent splendor of the basilica and the cathedral. The interior of the church consisted of three parts, the vestibule, the nave, and the choir. The congregation assembled in the nave, and here the pulpit was erected, the scriptures read, and the sermon delivered. The choir was used alone for the clergy, and for the readers and the singers. It corresponded to the holy of holies of the Jewish temple. It was separated from the nave by a lattice or railing and curtains, and was elevated above the nave. In the centre of the choir was a wooden table bearing the symbols of our Lord's death. In the rear, following the semicircular wall, the higher clergy sat, while the bishop sat on a cathedra or raised seat. Even before the time of Constantine, reigned 306-337, to pictures of scripture events had been set up in churches. The early church was familiar with such representations, and with symbolic images, as the Roman catacombs testify. There was very early, however, a distaste for all representations of deity or sacred characters. Clement of Alexandria expressed the sentiment of his age, quote, The custom of daily looking on the representation of the divine being desecrates his dignity. End quote. The time had not, as yet, arrived when Christian art was employed to clothe our Lord's person with ethereal beauty and sweetness. The theology of the times attributed to him the sad and homely visage of prophecy, and it was a quaint fancy of Tertullian that he could never have been despised of men and have suffered death for them if in his person he had manifested his heavenly glory. Origen held that his whole person was repulsive. The Eastern Church has never deviated from this view. In the Greco-Russian Church of today, whether amidst the barbaric splendor of the Cathedral of St. Isaac in St. Petersburg, or in the more ancient Church of the Transfiguration on the Kremlin, it is the same sad and austere countenance which we discover in the ancient frescoes of Ravenna. The Council of Elvira, A.D. 305, declared against the use of all images in sacred buildings, though its decisions were never respected out of Spain. The Western Church was inclined early to the use of images, and this preference was one of the causes which finally led to the division of the East and the West. End of chapter 23